is concerned, there have been some you know, uh, reports about third country meetings and things like that, but that is also not really very significant. Also important because Qatar is currently uh, being bypassed by the four uh, countries, not uh, Oman, but the three uh, GCC countries and Egypt. Uh, so, and another, another point, why actually I got interested in this uh, issue. Uh, in 2016, just after submitting my PhD, I was trying to uh, kind of uh, understand the geopolitics, the geostrategic aspects of Middle East uh, in a little better way. And I found out that in, uh, it was June, June 2016, May or June 2016, that a Saudi delegation led by former major general of Saudi uh, armed forces, uh, Anwar Ishti. He now, I mean, at that point of time, he was retired, obviously, and uh, uh, in 2000, and even now he heads a, a think tank based in Jada called the Center for uh, Political and Legal Studies. He headed a delegation that visited Israel and he met with a number of uh, uh, Israeli uh, politicians and also at that time uh, the, the chief of the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, secretary or something, uh, it was Tom, Tom Maribor, no, Joe Gold, sorry. It was Joe Gold who uh, with him, he had a meeting uh, in 2016. Uh, and the, the, the stated objective, it was not really widely reported. And the stated objective of the delegation was to promote the Arab Peace Initiative and discussion, promote discussion about the Arab Peace Initiative within Israel. And he also met some of the opposition uh, member of Neset, uh, including uh, uh, Omer Barlav and uh, uh, Michael Lawson and some others who were uh, uh, position in case at that point of time. Uh, this, this actually generated my interest in terms of is it something which, which will lead to something or is it just a, a kind of very, uh, uh, something completely ex even exceptional. It won't be repeated. Another thing was that whether is it something sanctioned by the Saudi government because a former Saudi Armed Force Major General visiting Israel, taking a leading a delegation to Israel, it, it completely kind of slipped, you know, it doesn't make any sense if it is not be kind of uh, clear by the ministry or by the, by the government. So my understanding was that it has been perhaps clear by the government, but they do not want to see kind of show their hands that they are also involved. This eventually led to a few more uh, meetings, but this was not either in Riyadh or in uh, any of the, uh, in Israel. It was in third countries, mostly in Washington. There were some meetings between Turkel Kassel and uh, uh, other you know, Israeli uh, officials. Turkel Kassel being the former Chief of the Intelligence of Saudi Arabia. And then there were some reports or opinion pieces in Arab Saudi newspapers advocating some kind of, you know, rapprochement or some kind of relations with Israel or justifying the contacts between the Saudi between Saudi Arabia and Israel. So this this is something, this was something completely new. And then obviously after that. Uh, uh, there are a few more contacts, and then in 2018, something very really interesting happened. Uh, uh, it was it is related to India and Israel, but then Saudi was involved. So the, for the first time, there was a direct flight between New Delhi and Tel Aviv uh, of Air India. It was it started, and Saudi Arabia gave clearance to Air India to to you know to use Saudi airspace to land in Tel Aviv and. Now the no, flight is functioning, it's thrice a week, four, four times a week, uh, and, and, and 
and it's quite working quite well. And there was some opposition actually from LR and saying that you know if you are giving clearance to Air India, why not to us as well? But then I think uh, it was you know kind of politically uh, and they were influenced not to take this issue publicly uh, because this actually kind of opens some space for political contacts rather than just uh, you know uh, any, any, anything else. The second thing uh, there was also I mean just, just because I'm standing in Czech, Czech Republic and I'm from India, there were some reports that said that the Israeli and Saudi intelligence officials or security officials had secret meetings at third party places, including in Czech Republic and in India. So <laughs> some some kind of <laughs> relevance here of both the countries. Uh, so yeah, I mean in addition to Saudi Arabia, the other countries, but but important to note that Saudi Arabia officially has not said anything on this issue. They have not, not come out openly that they have any contacts with Saudi uh, with Israel. So from the from the Saudi point of view, they have not said anything. The Israeli point of view, there have been some kind of you know symbolic statements from Benjamin Netanyahu and some other officials, but nobody has exactly said that we have open contacts with Saudi officials. Now, uh, it is slightly different when it comes to the UAE. Uh, till 2017, they did not allow any of the, the, there was mention about these four events. They did not allow Israeli flag to be displayed or Israeli anthem to be uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, sung when our uh, Israeli Joruka he uh, won gold. So he, despite he being, you know, the champion, it was not displayed, it was not, uh, the anthem was not played. In 2018, this completely changed. In October 2018, when, the, when another judo championship was being uh, played in, Israel, uh, in, in the UAE, again, the Israeli uh, athlete won the championship. Uh, he was a gold, uh, he won the gold, so obviously came first. And this time, both the flag was displayed and the anthem was played. And the other important aspect, the one of the, uh, the Israeli Minister of Culture and Sports, she visited UAE during the, the championship. And then she was taken on an official tour to the, in, uh, to the Zayed Grand Mosque, which is usually a kind of a practice for Visiting state, you know, heads that the, they are being, they, they are you know welcomed and taken to the symbolically taken to the you know national uh, monument. So she was taken there. She posed with the with one of the uh, 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 junior ministers who was taking her around, and then this was put on social media and so on and so forth. So in in the, Another thing is that in 2012, uh, when the discussions on JCPOA were in early stages, that the, the, for the first time it was kind of it had become clear that the negotiations are heading to a direction where some agreements can be done. At that point of time, also there were some secret meetings between uh, the uh, it was I think it was Israeli Prime Minister who had gone to Washington. And the UAE foreign minister Abdullah bin Zayed, he was also there, and they had a secret meeting. But this came out only in 2017. Till for the five, for five years between 2012 and 2017, this was never reported in any of the media. So, and then another issue uh, in 2015 uh, or 16, 2000, yeah, 2015, uh, the uh, office uh, 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 diplomatic mission to the International Renewable Energy Agency was opened in the UAE. So you have a country with which you don't have any diplomatic relations, but you have a diplomatic mission to a, a, a international organization in that country, and then you, your minister is visiting and being accorded almost a, a same status as a, a, a visiting, you know, a, a member of. Representative of the state. When it comes to Oman, the
the situation is completely different. Uh, Oman had in the past relations with, not exactly diplomatic relations, but there was a, uh, between 1996 to 2001, there was a, a trade office, of Israeli trade office functioning in Muscat. And that, at that point of time, it was both in Muscat and Doha, and uh, Prime Minister Rabin and then Prime Minister Shimon Peres, both of them had visited Oman and, uh, no, um, Tata only, I think only Shimon Peres visited, but Rabin had visited both uh, Qatar and Oman. But immediately, like within four years, you had the second intifada, the uh, second intifada, and everything just kind of vanished. There was no discussion about any kind of links. Even though when it comes to Qatar, there were still, I think even, even with Oman, there were some secret links between the trade offices. I mean, even though it was formally closed, uh, there were some give and take going on between Qatar and Israel. But after the oppression caste, mostly it was completely kind of, it completely changed. I and mean, there was no discussion, no talk about uh, having relation. And then in 2000, October 2018, we have Prime Minister Netanyahu visiting Oman and being welcomed in the palace by Sultan Qaboos. Uh, interestingly, this was made, made public, but only after Netanyahu returned to Tel Aviv, not while he was still in Muscat. But maybe for security reasons or anything, but I think there are some political symbolism as well, which can be given you know, right here. Uh, another thing, the Israeli, uh, the Omani um, uh, minister responsible for foreign affairs, Amber, uh, uh, Yusuf bin Alavi, he, in 2019 April, while speaking in the World Economic Forum in Amman, he said something very interesting. He said that the Arabs should stop. Uh, uh, I, I actually read the quote. Uh, he said, "I believe that we Arabs must be able to look into this issue. This issue may be part of Israel, or not the position of Israel, and try to ease those fears that Israel has to initiatives and real deals between us and Israel." So. At the forum, at the forum of Arab uh, International Forum in Amman, he is calling openly for embracing Israel, which is which is something uh, uh, unprecedented. He was criticized by the Jordanian authorities for saying, saying something like this, but no action was taken against him. I mean, he he said it, he was criticized, but he went back and he is still the foreign minister. I mean, the term is responsible for, but basically he is the government. Uh, so this is something very interesting. In the case of Bahrain also, something similar happened. So it was uh, one of the one of the uh, think tanks in, in Los Angeles, uh, uh, in uh, run by, uh, I just give you the name, uh, by Marvin Kerr. He said in 2018 that he was he was hosted by the King Hamad in his palace in Manama, and that he, he he said that he the king told him that he would like to have a relationship with Israel and the non-recognition of Israel as a country in the Middle East is a mistake. So the king did not say anything, but this was quoted and it was, nobody actually said that no, uh, this was not said. So. Again, it is something very indirect, but not directly coming from the king himself, but nobody is denying also that the king did not say. And this was said during an event in Los Angeles when the king, when the king's son, who is uh, Prince Nasser, most likely he will be, uh, if, if, uh, he, he, I don't think formally the crown prince, but most likely he will be the higher to the throne uh, in the next uh, once again, you know, passing uh, away. So Prince Nasser was actually attending the event, the Hanukkah event, in, uh, in that uh, think tank, and then this was the statement had come. So what I'm trying to do is that if you look at all these, you know, bits and pieces events which are not happening in a coherent way, it, it shows that there is a 
degree of acceptance among not only the political elites, but also to some extent the intelligentsia in these countries towards developing some relations with Israel. Now, it could be only because of the security, you know, considerations. So, that is what I am coming to. So, factors responsible for or limiting factors as far as the contacts are concerned. So, my understanding is that it is mainly security considerations that are propelling these countries, the Gulf countries, to actually reach out to Israel. But uh, if one looks a little deeper, there are other considerations as well. There are some diplomatic and commercial uh, considerations as was uh, presented during the previous paper. Uh, that there are commercial considerations as well. So security I mean security aspect is the, I mean there is no need to explain. It is the Iran factor which is the most important factor as far as the security is concerned. Israel and the Arab Gulf countries have a very common interest as far as the Israeli uh, Iranian security threat is concerned. Uh, Iran, Iranian military presence, the way it is expanding, not only in the Persian Gulf, but also in the entire Middle East region, is considered a security threat not only by Israel, but also by Gulf countries, because for them also it's a question of existence. Because Israel, uh, Iranian leaders and uh, uh, the revolutionary leaders in Iran have in the past have talked about the need for uh, revolution in these countries to to bring change or to bring regime change in these countries. So that is something completely. Uh, if I look at it, it's a essential threat for Israel. Also, we, we, it's quite well known. The uh, Israel, uh, Iranian leaders have spoken in so many words to. For the destruction of Israel. Uh, so obviously, I mean, it, it, it is quite clear. Now, what are the diplomatic and commercial considerations? I will not go into the details as far as the commercial issues are concerned, that has already been spoken about. Uh, but as far as the diplomatic issue is concerned from the Gulf point of view, Israel has a strong leverage in Washington. And even though they have, they are considered to be allies of the U.S., uh, the distance between U.S. and Gulf countries' perspective on Iran, especially when the JCPOA was signed, was increasing. And this has continued in many, many ways because because of the way Trump administration is functioning. So, for, from their point of view, if they have uh, good relations with Israel or some kind of a, you know. A, Understanding with Israel, this can be leveraged in Washington and in other places as well. Now, when it comes to the from the Israeli perspective, this is this is something which which I mean, which is one of the basic uh, one can say uh, uh, aspects of Israeli foreign policy to to strive for recognition, to strive for recognition and as part of being. Not, on, not only with non-Arab countries, but also with Arab countries. I mean, this is a basic pillars, I would say, uh, uh, yeah, if I can use that word, of the Israeli foreign policy. So, if there is there is any chance for, of recognition from Arab countries, or any chance of recognition within the Middle East, within the neighborhood, I think that is something from the Israeli point of view worth pursuing. So, for me, both have some diplomatic Apart from the security uh, pers uh, perspective, has some diplomatic perspective as well. Now, the question which is which is most important is uh, whether there what are the factors limiting these you know contacts? I mean, there are public opinion issues. There are issues regarding regarding how the not only their own local domestic population their own citizens, how they would perceive, but also how the Muslim world as a whole will perceive. Uh, for example, Muslims in India, Pakistan, or Indonesia, Malaysia, some other countries, how they would perceive, especially because the question uh, is not only about the Palestinian state, but also about the status of Jerusalem. And we, we, have, we saw that when Trump administration recognized, said that it is going to recognize in uh, 
shifting and deformation had happened much earlier, it, it was only that they were accumulating and affecting. Uh, that they said, um, it was said that you know, there would be the shift of embassy from Italy to Jerusalem, and it happened. The country which took the lead in, in at international forums to resist that was so weird. It was King Salman who immediately convened a meeting of OIC and then it was taken in the UN and all that. So this shows that even, even if at one level they want to pursue some relations with Israel, at another level they can't. Because it's a, it's not just about a question of their own domestic issues, but also the larger public opinion in the uh, global Muslim public opinion. And also because they, they it's a question of they be the leaders of the you know Muslim world, be the uh, be the custodian of the two holy places. So they can't really say that okay, the third holy place <laughs> I can compromise on that, the two is with us. So that is something which is very important, which is a very important limiting factor. And obviously the second is the uh, Palestinian issue. Uh, I think that is again a very important uh, limiting factor because uh, uh, it is it is something which which they can't really compromise on. It's again a question of uh, whether to, to what extent you can compromise, whether you accept two states solution or you can go a little further and do more compromise. From my understanding, beyond the Arab peace initiative, at this stage it would be difficult for any of the Gulf countries to go beyond the Arab peace initiative and say that we will recognize Israel if, even if we do not have a Palestinian state in the within the 1967 boundaries. So I think these are the two uh, uh, important limiting factors. I will leave it here with with a question as to whether this will eventually lead to some kind of a formal thing or at the first event of you know disruptions as far as the Palestinian conflict is concerned.